Buddha's final instruction was to bring about completion through heedfulness. Which means that in English, the last word he spoke was hatefulness. However, in Pali, it was the other way around. The last word he spoke was bring about completion. But heedfulness is the means by which it's done. And as he said elsewhere, that heedfulness is the source of all skillfulness. The practice of developing what's skillful is the most basic Buddhist teaching. And some people accuse the Buddha of not teaching anything in particular, not making any definite statements. One of his students said, no, that's true. He was very definite about what's skillful and unskillful. And when the student read, later reported this conversation, the Buddha said it was well spoken, because the Buddha himself said that this was one of his definitive teachings. So heedfulness lies at the, the basis of the teaching, the basis of the practice. And so it's good to think about what it means to be heedful. On the one hand, it means that your actions do make a difference. If they didn't make a difference, there'd be no need to be heedful. Just do whatever you wanted, and there'd be no consequences. But they really do make a difference, so you have to be heedful. The idea of heedfulness also implies there's something you have to protect. Usually, we think about protecting your life by being heedful. In other words, if you act in a careless way, you might kill yourself, or you might harm other people, or you might damage your belongings. But for the Buddha, it's the simple fact of being alive or having belongings is not in and of itself a virtue. As he once said, a one day lived mindfully is better than a hundred years lived mindlessly. One day live with virtue, one day live with concentration, one day live with in discerning the rising and passing away of your mental states. It's better than a whole hundred years of living without doing any of those things. So what's really precious here, what's really valuable here, is not so much your life as it is good qualities of the mind. We find this confirmed in other teachings. We talk of the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha as being jewels. When you have a jewel, you want to protect it. You have to be heedful that it, you don't leave it around or it might get lost. And so in this case, being protective of these jewels means trying to develop their qualities in your mind. As the Buddha said, the qualities that led to his awakening were ardency, mindfulness, and resolution. Okay, you want to protect these qualities as jewels in your mind. The Dharma means not only knowledge of what the Buddha taught, but also the practice of the Dharma to the point where you actually attain the Dharma inside. That should all be protected. The Sangha should be protected in the sense that you want to keep their virtues in mind. And always live conscious of the fact that they've lived. They've given their lives to the practice and they benefited. So we have an example that shows how noble human life can be. You don't want to forget that example. Another thing the Buddha says to protect is the truth. You know, in everyday language that means 
once you've made a statement, you stick by it. You make a promise, then you protect the truth of your promise. But there's also a passage where the Buddha makes a statement that truth should be protected, and he goes on to define the truth as nirvana. How do you protect nirvana? In it, in and of itself, doesn't need protection, but you want to protect your access to it. Make sure you don't close off the way. This means that you protect the qualities of the path in your mind. Everything from right view on through to right concentration, these things are valuable. These are among the things that you should show respect for. So the path is something you want to develop. And the chant we chanted just now, the Buddha talks about the different duties appropriate to the Four Noble Truths. And these are the duties of a person who practices the Dharma. You want to develop the path. So you can comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, and realize the cessation of suffering. So be very protective of this path. Do your best to keep nurturing it. What this means is when skillful mental qualities arise in the mind, you don't just sit there and watch them come and watch them go. You watch them coming and going because you have an agenda. You want to figure out why it is that they come, why it is that they go. So that once you understand the causes, you can turn them in the direction you want. This is why this is called a training. We're not just passively observing things and hoping that somehow we will wear out our defilements by being totally non-reactive. We have to observe things so we can understand them. That means actively questioning, actually probing. We want to know. The Buddha very strongly encouraged questions because they are a sign that you want to know. But if you don't ask questions, you're not really interested. So he encouraged questionings. He one time made the statement that there are two types of assemblies. The assemblies where cross-questioning is encouraged and people get training in cross-questioning. Now there's once statement has been made, if you don't understand, you're, you should ask, what does this mean, or how is this? Which probably means, what's the connection here? How does X connect to Y? What things are causes and conditions for one another? What things are not related? That kind of question. The second assembly is when he says trained in bombast. In other words, they just learn how to listen to beautiful statements. And just leave it at that. They feel good and warm and fuzzy all over. And they're trained in learning how to speak in a way that's good and warm and fuzzy. But it doesn't get anywhere. It doesn't lead to any understanding. So an important quality in gaining wisdom is to learn how to ask questions, to try to figure things out. So when a skillful state arises in the mind, you want to figure out, how do I keep it going? And if you find that it disappears, you want to figure out, well, what happened? Why did it disappear? Similarly with unskillful states. So you see something unskillful coming in the mind, you want to watch it with the idea that you want to figure out where it's coming from so you can undercut the cause. So there's a lot of active questioning and probing here that's an important part of the path. And you want to protect that part of the mind that's interested in knowing, that wants to know. This desire here is not a the craving that causes suffering. It's part of the desire of right effort, the desire to figure things out in terms of what's skillful and what's unskillful, so you can apply the right effort. trying to prevent the unskillful or to get rid of it once it's arisen, 
As for the skillful, it has, if it hasn't arisen yet, you try your best to give rise to it. And once it's there, you try to maintain it and get it to grow. These are your duties on the path. And you want to protect that sense of duty. Don't let other things get in its way. Especially those of us who are ordained. It's this, these are the duties of our lives, to develop the path so that we can comprehend suffering, abandon its cause, realize the cessation of suffering. That's the bottom line here. So we want to do what we can to protect a community where this is the bottom line. This is how you protect the jewel of the Sangha. If we can't protect it in this way, it's very hard for the Dharma to survive out there in the, the environment of the, of the marketplace. Because out there the Dharma has to be something that sells, and it gets changed, it gets warped by the pressure to make money, which is the bottom line in most institutions. This is why the Buddha was so adamant, one, that the Dharma be given freely as a gift, and two, that it was important that the Sangha be maintained as an environment where the issues of making money are not paramount. The big issue is, what are you doing to train your mind? Whatever comes up, whatever issue there is, what are you doing to train your mind? To develop and to protect those qualities that are precious inside. So we have the opportunity to practice now. This is the other aspect of heedfulness, is that we don't know how much time we're going to have. to develop those other two qualities of ardency and resolution, to make the most of the opportunities that you do have while you have them. The future is uncertain, but you prepare for the future by being heedful of what you're doing right now, protecting what's valuable right now, by being careful, ardent, resolute, attentive, observant. These are some of the aspects of what it means to be heedful. And this is how the path comes to completion.